Prepare for a rude awakening. Four thousand years ago, the creator of the universe made an everlasting covenant with Abraham. All the land, from the Euphrates to the Nile, belongs to the sons of Israel. Shock waves will shake the earth as heaven reaches down to fulfill that promise. Traditions. Traditions can blind us from the truth and cause us to wander in the myopic fog of man-made religious systems for an entire lifetime. Many of the traditions of the Western Gentile Christian Church are merely adapted pagan sun god worship rituals inherited from our ancestors. They were forced to compromise with the Roman Emperor Constantine or lose their life for refusing to bow. Most of these traditions were imported directly from Babylon. In fact, there is not a single religion practiced upon the face of the earth today that has not been polluted by Nimrod's rebellion against the one true God. I'm Michael Rood. Prepare for a rude awakening. If you, like I, grew up in Western civilization, by the time you were three years old, you knew that on Christmas Eve, a pot-bellied man in a cherry red suit dropped through the chimney and placed presents under an evergreen tree festooned with gold and silver balls. Christian children were told that this was a celebration of the birth of the baby Jesus. And at the time, you were neither intellectually or philosophically capable of refuting the validity of this tradition. But by the time you entered kindergarten and the debates among your classmates raged, you perceived that you had been told a lie. Your concept of reality was shaken. Tears flooded your eyes as you came to the realization there is no Santa Claus. The Hebrew scriptures expose the perverted traditions of man-made religions and offer reality to those who hunger and thirst for truth. Shaul, commonly known as the Apostle Paul, wrote that we should not be misled by traditions and commandments of men, but rather rely upon a tested and proven source of truth, the Torah, the five books of Moses. The children of Israel camped at Mount Sinai for an entire year as Moses passed on the instructions from the Creator. These instructions, called Torah in Hebrew, taught us how to govern ourselves and throw off the shackles of man-made religious, political, and economic systems. Yahshua, or as many know him by his Gentile nickname, Jesus, warned his followers that traditions promulgated by religious leaders are like leaven or yeast which once mingled with dough cannot be removed. Without the Torah of God, it is impossible to separate the traditions of men from the rules of the Almighty. Rudimentary explanation. The English word tradition is derived from the Latin tradiere, which means to lay into the hands of another. When someone lays something into your hands, you expect that the intention of the gift is good. Thank you but it is the responsibility of the recipient to inspect the gift. Yeah! Traditions can be good or evil. The recipient must carefully inspect that which is laid into his hands. I hate when that happens. <laughs> Jeremiah said that in the last days, the Gentiles would come to Israel and cry out in repentance, 
Surely our fathers have inherited lies. If our fathers inherited a lie, what they pass on to us does not magically become the truth by virtue of their sincerity. Traditions are given to us in innocence and accepted in ignorance. We are like the blind following the blind. Those who are leading us may not have any intention of misleading us, but they are nonetheless blind, and we will both certainly fall into a ditch unless we have our eyes open to the truth. But what is truth? Truth means reality, that which is. Truth is reality whether one believes it or not. One can believe a lie his entire life, and it will never change into truth just to suit his belief system. If we are to live the truth, we must be willing to constantly challenge the traditions and teachings that we've inherited from our parents and religious systems, as well as our own thinking patterns. I was an adult before I questioned the pictures in my mind of Daniel as a young boy standing safely in the lion's den. Once that picture was embedded, I had no reason to question its validity. Years later, however, a new picture developed from the scriptures, an old Daniel, Adiash, who had been a ruler of Babylon under Nebuchadnezzar, Baal-shazar, and now Darius, who was tricked into commanding that Daniel, his vice president, be executed. Daniel and his Jewish companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azrael, were raised in Jerusalem and taught the scriptures from their youth. When they were carried away as captives into Babylon, they were renamed Baal to Shazar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and made eunuchs under the care of Ashpenaz, master of eunuchs, and trained for service in the court of the king. Daniel was promoted to prime minister under King Nebuchadnezzar and was made an extremely wealthy young man. Daniel was multiplied in wealth twice more during the reigns of Belshazzar and again under Darius the Mede. Daniel was one of the richest men in the kingdom. For more than 60 years, Daniel was in charge of the Chaldeans, a group of highly trained astronomers, intellectuals, among whom were many Judean captives. Near the end of his life, Daniel was visited by the angel Gabriel and given very exact timing concerning the coming of the Messiah but he was also instructed to seal up some of the information. Apparently, it was for him, and for him alone, to understand and act upon. Daniel died in Babylon, a eunuch, with no heir to whom he could leave his wealth. It would be the acme of foolishness to assume that a man as wealthy and prophetically well-informed as Daniel would not have made very careful plans for the distribution of his treasure. After the 70 years of captivity had ended, many of the Jews, especially those in positions of responsibility, stayed behind in Babylon, the most notable being Mordecai and his niece Hadassah, better known as Queen Esther. Daniel would have naturally assigned the execution of his will to his most trusted companions, the Jewish Chaldean astronomers whom he trained and who remained behind in Babylon. There is a reason for every word in the scriptures, regardless of how trivial these details may seem to us. By carefully considering the scriptures and historical records, we often see very compelling pictures develop from the text. So, what became of Daniel's estate? It will be nearly 500 years before any hint of Daniel's treasure reappears in the pages of the scriptures. How many wise men came to present gifts to Jesus? Where did they find him, and how was he dressed? Uh, there were three wise men. He was lying in a manger, and I believe he was in swaddling clothes. I believe there were three wise men. Of course, three. Three? Yes, three. The way I understand, it was uh, three wise men who came to visit Jesus. Uh, he was found in a ma manger. In a manger. In a manger. And I believe he was wearing swaddling cloths. In squaddling clothes. Uh, actually, he was dressed in a swaddling clothes. Um, in swaddling clothes.
Ask the man or woman on the street, how many wise men came to present gifts to Jesus? Where did they find him, and how was he dressed? As you can see, the common answer is three wise men found the newborn babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. That, however, is not the testimony of the scriptures. We read in the King James Version of Matthew's account that an undesignated number of wise men in the Greek Magi came to the house where they found the young child, Yahshua, living with his mother Miriam and Yosef. In the Gospel of Luke, we read that only the shepherds arrived at the manger. Sorry for this rude interruption, but Yahshua was actually born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the 15th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar which always occurs in autumn, not December 25th when the pagan sun gods were said to be born. His birth was an intermediate fulfillment of the Feast of Sukkot, or mangers. It is the same word in the Hebrew language. Yosef was required to live in a sukkah or tabernacle during the entire seven-day feast. Miriam, his pregnant wife, was not required to live in the sukkah, but the Bethlehem bed and breakfast was completely booked. So she joined her husband in the sukkah on the first day of the Feast of Sukkot and delivered her firstborn son in the sukkah. That is the moment when the word was made flesh and sukkoted or tabernacled. In the King James Version, dwelt among us. To suggest that a lonesome trio, laden with treasure, crossed the torrid sands of the desert outside the protection of a large armed caravan exposes a lack of sound thinking. They would not have been wise men, but fools to venture unaccompanied through the wilderness. These magi, a common term for Chaldean astronomers, were the descendants of the very Jewish astronomers Daniel trained and entrusted with his treasure. Following Daniel's instruction, the astronomers watched the skies for more than 500 years, searching for the great sign in the heavens that finally occurred on Tishri 1, at the end of the fourth millennium. The constellation Betula, the Virgin, clothed with the setting sun, the first sliver of the new moon beneath her feet, and in the 12 stars above her head, the planet Hatzadik, the righteous, came into conjunction with the star Habelic, the king, in the constellation of Ariel the Lion of Judah. On the first day of the month of Tishri, on Yom Teruah, the day of trumpets, this one-time celestial alignment announced the upcoming birth of the Melech Tzadik, the righteous King of Kings, the Lion of the tribe of Judah.